Amen. Well, good morning, Mercy Hill. My name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, before we dive into the message, I want to give you a brief update from last Sunday. So last Sunday, it was our Child Sponsorship Sunday. And here at Mercy Hill, we sponsor with different uh, organizations, partners all over the world. And one of those is Vision Trust International. What Vision Trust International does is they uh, serve children who are orphaned, abandoned, impoverished, and they raise up local leaders that will oversee the long-term work, but then they invite churches like us to come and partner with them. And so this year, we've sent two teams down to the Dominican Republic to work with these children. We uh, hope to send one more team later this fall. But last Sunday, we gave you the opportunity to sponsor one of these children for $40 a month to help provide some of their nutrition, some of their housing, uh, to help equip them to, to grow in Christ. And $40 a month, it may or may not be significant for you, but $40 a month is certainly significant for each of those children. Well, Last Sunday, there were 104 children sponsored by you guys, right? So praise God for that. And I was talking with some of the Vision Trust representatives this week, and they said that that was the largest uh, one-time event child sponsorship in their organization's history. So I praise God for how he has unlocked our church's generosity uh, to give beyond ourselves, to give to those in need. Well, today we are going to be wrapping up our series studying the book of Mark. We're going to be in Mark chapter 16, looking at the account of the resurrection. Now, the claim that Jesus rose from the dead has impacted the world like nothing else in all of history, okay? Today, there are billions of of followers of Jesus all across the planet. They are not uh, just in one geographical location, but Christianity literally spans the globe. But now think about this. Jesus, when he was on this earth, he never held a political office, never held a position of prominence. He never wrote a book. He never created a masterpiece of art. During his short three-year public ministry, he never traveled more than 100 miles from his rural hometown. And at the end of his life, he was executed as a criminal, okay? A life like that doesn't typically get put down into the history books, much less shape the history of the world. So something happened, right? And those billions of believers in the world today would say that what happened was the resurrection, The resurrection that Jesus came back from the dead, it sparked a revolution, and it is why we're even here today. Now, some of you, you may be here, and and you're like, well, I don't really believe in the resurrection, or I think maybe it's just an inspiring story or or something. Last time I checked, the death rate is still at 100% for all of us, okay? Uh, I know it's kind of morbid to think about, but uh, that's the reality, and so... Uh, Even a report that someone could come back from the dead should cause us to kind of want to lean in a little bit, right, and do some fact-checking. But then there are some of us who we'd say, you know what, we believe in the power of the resurrection to kind of give us life eternally with God, but we don't really see how it impacts our life here and now, the day-to-day, the ordinary life that we live in. Well, let me give you a roadmap for where we're going to go. What we're going to see is we're going to take a look at how the resurrection impacts three areas of our life. We're going to see how the resurrection impacts our faith, how it impacts our future, and how it impacts our purpose for every day. So I invite you, if you have a Bible, you can pull up a copy of Scripture on your phone to go to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8 is where we'll be. And while you're getting there, I want to just kind of catch you up to speed of what's happened in the story. So Jesus was just crucified and he was buried. And Mark writes that these, there are some, a group of women who came to Jerusalem with Jesus. They saw him crucified, and they saw where he was buried. But he was buried right before the Sabbath. And so any good Jew in Israel would just rest. They would cease from their work on the Sabbath. And so the Sabbath has now ended, and these women are going to the tomb where Jesus was buried in order to finish the preparations uh, anointing him for burial. So in Mark chapter 16, verse 1, we read, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Now let me pause right there because I want to point something out. 
In the entire book of Mark, he has not once named a single woman, not even the mother of Jesus. These are different Marys here, okay? And so it's interesting that here, as he is concluding his book, he makes reference to these women, not once, but actual multiple times. He introduced them just a couple verses earlier in chapter 15, where he says, hey, they came with Jesus to Jerusalem. They saw him being crucified. They saw where he was buried, right? Now, we'll see the significance of that in just a moment, but I just want you to to hold on to that. Let's keep reading. It says in verse 3, and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See for yourselves the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So when the women get to the tomb, they're surprised to see the stone rolled away. But then they're shocked to see this young man dressed in white sitting there in the tomb and Jesus' body gone. Now, the way that Mark describes this young man dressed in white, it has all the markers of an angelic being, of someone of supernatural being. And so this is an angel. And the message that the angel gives to these women is very simple, yet it is profound. It is Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. That simple message, he has risen, is what sparked the entire Christian movement, the movement that in a matter of a few centuries would completely turn the Roman Empire upside down, the movement that continues to spread and grow even to this day. But did the resurrection actually happen? That's what some of you are thinking in your own mind. Did the resurrection actually happen? That's what all of us should be thinking and wrestling with. Because without the resurrection, there's no basis for the Christian faith. Paul, who wrote more books in the New Testament than any other author, he puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. He said, if Christ is not, has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Right? So if the resurrection didn't happen, we should all just pack up and go home. There's no point in us even being here. So let's examine this. Are there any other explanations for what happened? Well, one attempt to explain the rise of Christianity is to say that it's based on a legend. Now, we all know that legends can spread and grow, right? I mean, how many of you still believe to this day that if you swallow a piece of gum, it's going to take seven years to digest? Right? <laughs> Believe that. Guess what? Sorry to break it to you. It's not true, right? Or um, take this one. Did you ever hear growing up that you should not kill a praying mantis, that it was illegal to do so, and if you were caught doing it, you would be fined? Well, it's not true. Don't do it, though, right? I mean, they're cute, so why would you do that? But then here's the, here's the legend that really got me. So I have two boys, and they're young, and one of their favorite TV shows is Daniel Tiger, which is based off of the TV show that I grew up watching, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And there was a legend going around that Mr. Rogers served as a Navy SEAL before he became a TV personality, right? (laughs) I mean, that's pretty cool to think about. But it's not true. In fact, he was a pastor before a TV personality. So you know what? I can understand the confusion there. (laughs) Is the resurrection of Jesus just another one of these urban legends that's kind of grown out of hand? Well, the written account of the resurrection are written in such a way that verify it as a historical event. Remember how I paused and said, hey, when Mark introduces these women, it's the first time that he's really talked about women in his whole entire Bible. The importance of this is that women in first century were seen as less than men. They were not seen as equal. They were seen as inferior to men. So much so that a woman's testimony in court was not even considered as evidence. It wasn't held as credible. But in all four accounts of Jesus' life, women are recorded to being the first witnesses to the resurrection. You see, if the gospel writers were wanting to make this up as a legend, they would not have used women as the key witnesses in their story. Female witnesses made these claims less credible in that day. So the only reason to 
write about these women who were the first witnesses was if these women were in fact the first witnesses. So Mark clearly understood this to be a historical, verifiable event. The reason he even gives us their names is he's saying, hey, you want to fact check me on this? Go and ask them. Go and ask them for yourselves. Okay, so the gospel writers, they didn't intentionally make the resurrection up, but maybe they were confused. Maybe they're misled. Is there some other explanation for the resurrection? You know, some people, they've proposed that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, that because of the suffering, he passed out. But then when they buried him, he was able to revive and regain consciousness and then uh, escape the tomb. So let's think about this one, okay? Jesus, before going to the cross, was beaten and scourged in such a way that the flesh was ripped off of his back. A crown of thorns was pressed into his skull and then being nailed to the cross, there were nails in his wrists and his feet. The blood loss at this point is abundant. And in order for Jesus to keep breathing, he would have to pull himself up on those nails to keep from suffocating from him on himself. And then when Jesus finally stops pulling himself up, when he stops moving, when he stops breathing, a Roman soldier, a master of execution, comes and thrusts a spear into his side and fluid immediately pours out. All of that, and we're to believe that he just passed out, And then when they laid him in a grave, he recovered such trauma with no food, no water or anything like that. And then if he were to recover in such a way that he hadn't fully died, then he's able to roll back the stone and escape the Roman guards that were there guarding the tomb. I personally don't have enough faith to believe in that story. So another explanation is that Jesus' body was maybe misplaced. Maybe it was stolen. Well, it wasn't misplaced because we can go back to Mark 15, verse 47, and Mark clearly says, hey, these women that you can go and you can fact check me on this, they saw where Jesus was buried. Matthew's account tells us about the Roman soldiers who stood guard to prevent anyone from stealing the body. And the biblical writers, they acknowledge that uh, what the Jews and the Romans did and to try to keep this story quiet, to try to keep it from spreading, is they fabricated this story that the body was stolen. But if the Romans and Jewish leaders wanted to completely stamp out the whole Christian movement, all they had to do was produce a body. That's all they had to do, but they couldn't because Jesus rose from the dead. He literally, physically came back to life. And he appeared at different times and different places to hundreds of people. Now I get that one or two people, they could have a hallucination where they think that someone that had died had come back to life, but Jesus appeared to 500 people at once. It would be extremely rare for 500 people in the same place at the same time to all have the same hallucination. Furthermore, hallucinations don't eat and drink with you like Jesus did with his disciples after the resurrection. Perhaps the best evidence, though, for the resurrection of Jesus is that those disciples who denied him when Jesus was captured and on trial ended up being imprisoned, persecuted, and martyred themselves because they said they could not deny what they had seen and heard, and that is the resurrected Jesus. They would not have given their life for something that they knew to be a lie. The evidence is compelling that an actual physical resurrection is the best explanation of the historical events. And it's something that we all need to wrestle with. It's something that we can't just leave here unaffected by. So what impact does the resurrection have on our faith, on our belief? The first point in the message today is that the resurrection of Jesus, it makes our faith sure. It gives us confidence to believe. We can trust the Bible and what Jesus said. We can follow the movement because we can be as sure, we can be as sure of the resurrection as we can of anything else in history. The resurrection, it gives us our basis for truth. It's not just some leap into the dark. You see, the resurrection, it authenticates Jesus is who he said he is. Jesus, he said that he was going to suffer and die. He said that he would be handed over to Gentiles to be executed. He said that they would flog him, mock him, spit on him. But most unusual is he said that on the third day, he would rise again. 
Now, if we heard someone talking like that, we would call them crazy. We would say that they're a lunatic until we witness their death and then see them alive again. So when the risen Jesus claims in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth is mine, there is no contesting it. Because every single word that he spoke came true. You see, we can try to do with God what we will. We can define him however we like. We can constrain him to our preferences. We can even crucify him and seal him in a tomb. But even that will not stop God from being God. Now, maybe you're here and you're just just checking things out. And right now, you don't feel like you can fully buy in to the Christian faith because there are some claims in Christianity that are hard for you to understand. Right? The, the Trinity, just as an example, it might be a hang-up for you. How can God be three in one? But rather than put your faith only in what you can explain, consider what you can't deny. Consider what can't be denied. Consider the resurrection. If the resurrection is true, then it authenticates that Jesus is who he said he is. You know, as believers, there's things that we can't fully explain to the degree that we would like about our faith, about who God is. But the resurrection is something that we can't deny. And so it makes our faith sure. If the resurrection is reliable, then Jesus is trustworthy, even with the things that you don't understand. G.K. Chesterton, he said it this way. He said, the problem with Christianity is not that it has been tried and found wanting or found lacking, but that it has been found difficult and left untried. You see, the evidence is there, but the implications are massive. If Jesus is who he said he is, then I must surrender my throne and give it to him. It's no longer about my will be done, but it's about thy will be done. And giving up control like this, it feels like death. Actually, it doesn't feel like death. It is death. It is death to self. But that's okay. Because not only does the resurrection make our faith sure, the second point I want to bring out is that the resurrection makes our future secure. The resurrection, it makes our future secure. During the entire time on earth, Jesus, he was completely perfect. He was always obedient. He was the perfect son of God. Death is the penalty for disobedience. So why did Jesus die? If Jesus was perfect and death is a punishment for our imperfections, our disobedience, then why did Jesus die? Well, he died as a substitute for us. He took our sin, our wrongs, our disobedience upon himself. Romans 4.25 says it like this. He says that he was delivered up for our trespasses. You see, we're the ones that broke God's commands. We're the ones that have strayed from God's design. We're the ones that deserve death. But Jesus, he stepped in to take the penalty for us. Romans 4.25 goes on to say that Jesus was raised for our justification. Okay? Being justified, it means being made right. Being right about something. So, for example, when a convicted criminal serves his or her sentence, he goes home free. Right? The sentence has been served. Or when you pay off a debt, that debt is erased. It's no longer held over you. And so when Jesus stepped out of the grave, the sentence for our sin had been completely served. The resurrection of God, the resurrection of Jesus is God's declaration that our penalty has been paid in full. There is nothing left to pay. In Romans 8, Paul asks this rhetorical question. He says, who can bring a charge against God's elect, against God's people? The answer is no one. So I want you to imagine this scene. I want you to imagine that Satan himself enters into the throne room of heaven. And Satan enters into the throne room of heaven to try to condemn you for your faults and failures. And all he has to do is he has to prove you guilty of just one failure. And that is enough to condemn you and to separate you from God forever. But in that heavenly courtroom, Jesus is by the, the, the throne of God. He's there at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and power subjected to him. And he's 
interceding for his people. And so when Satan gets up and he levels his charge against you, Jesus steps in and says, the penalty has been paid. Jesus looks at Satan and says, Satan, be gone. He looks at you and he says, come and enter. See, Jesus, he died for our sins and he was raised for our salvation and in him our future is secure. The resurrection, though, it also gives us a glimpse of what our future will be like. Jesus, he raised his literal physical body. His disciples were able to touch the scars, the wounds in his wrists where the nails had been. Now, this should revolutionize the way that some of us think about heaven, right? Often our concept of heaven is some spiritually detached existence, some floating on the clouds or something, right? That's what we think about, but let's be honest, it's hard to look forward to that. But the resurrection, it's the first fruit showing of what is to come. It's the creation that God originally made and he looked at and he said, this is good. It's this creation redeemed and restored. It's body and soul continued and perfected. Martin Luther was asked what he would do if he knew for certain that Jesus was going to come back tomorrow. Right? Think about that just for a minute. How would you respond if you were asked, hey, if you knew for sure that Jesus was coming back tomorrow, what would you do? How would you spend the next 24 hours? This is what Martin Luther said he would do. He said, I'd plant a tree. And that's odd, right? That's not how we typically think because when we think about the life to come, we're more inclined to cling to the life here and now. We don't see the continuation. But Luther understood that the life to come was the best of this life without corruption. A tree would thrive in a world without sickness and decay. So when you think of the kingdom of God, when you think of the future, think of something that's very physical. Think of this earth without the pain and the suffering and the disease. Think of the crippled dancing. Think of the blind seeing. Think of the hungry fed. Think of the goodness in this life that brings you to light with all of your troubles and struggles put to rest. A couple years ago, I read a book uh, that highlights the stories of persecuted believers around the world. It's called The Insanity of God, uh, written by Nick Ripkin. And uh, they're actually making this into a documentary movie that they're going to be showing around the triad for one day in theaters uh, later this month. And I would love to see just tons of people from Mercy Hill go and, and view that movie. Um, but in The Insanity of God, uh, one of the stories that Nick Ripkin highlights is a story of this uh, family um, there's a man named Stoyan in the family, and they lived in Eastern Europe, and they suffered intense persecution under the communist rule. And as Nick Ripkin interviews Stoyan, Stoyan tells of a time when he was about 12 or 13 years old, and he and his mother go to visit his father, who was in a prison camp. And the reason his father was in a prison camp is because his father was a pastor and would not deny his faith in Jesus Christ. And over the period of years that his father was in prison, they were only allowed to go and see him twice. And this was the first time that they had been allowed to see him. They were given one hour to visit with his father. And so as the time, as that hour comes to a close, Stoyan's mother knew what her husband, his father, would want the most. And so she takes a pocket New Testament and tries to sneak it under his wool cap. Well, one of the guards sees her trying to do this, so he rushes over there, and he takes the book, and he hands it to his superior officer. And his officer comes, and he looks at the book, and then furiously throws it down, and he looks at Storian's mother, and he says, do you not realize that it is because of this book, and it is because of your God, that your husband is in prison here? Do you not know that I could kill your husband, I could kill you, I could even kill your son, and I would be applauded for it? Stoyan's mother responded, Sir, you are right. You can kill my husband, you can kill me, I know that you can even kill our son, but nothing you can do will separate us from the love that is Jesus Christ. See, the resurrection, it makes our faith sure. And it makes our future secure. And a sure faith and a secure future, it brings a power that changes our every day. 
So the third point that I want you to see is that the resurrection, it makes our purpose clear. After reporting to the women that Jesus is not here, that he is risen, he tells them, go tell his disciples and Peter that he wants to see you in Galilee. Go tell. That's the same commission that Jesus gives to all of his followers. See, the resurrection, it gives us new life, but it also gives us a new direction. It tells us, hey, there's a better role for you to play now. Our future is secure so we can stop striving to preserve ourselves and to promote ourselves in this life. And we're free to just promote him. We are called to tell others who Jesus is, that the future is in his hands, that he is the eternal king. Now, perhaps some of you say, you know, I believe in the resurrection. I'm super thankful that it changes my eternity, but... You say, Pastor, I just don't think God can use me in the here and now. I, I don't know why you think that. But notice how verse 7 mentions Peter specifically. Why is that? Why is Peter singled out? Well, it's because Peter had fallen the hardest. It's because as Jesus is being led away, Peter denies him outright, denies even knowing him. So what grace this is for the message from the Lord to be, hey, tell Peter, I want to see him. Tell Peter, I want to meet him. Peter, the one who messed up the worst, he's restored by the risen Jesus, and he actually becomes the leader of Jesus' followers. And he didn't become the leader because he was the most educated or the most savvy, but because he had been with Jesus and was changed by the power of the resurrection. You know, all of us, we live our lives trying to fashion ourselves into an image that we've elevated in our minds, right? So uh, little boys and little girls, they dress up as superheroes and princesses because they imagine themselves becoming those things one day. As teens, we compare ourselves to our peers and we strive to fit in, to look the part of the group that we want to aspire to belong to. Even as parents, we compare ourselves to what other parents do, what they feed their kids, how they educate their kids, even the type of vacations and experiences they offer their kids. And we set up an image of what we think is best and most desirable, and we chase after that image. We're all wired this way. The Bible calls us image bearers. That's what it means. But then what we do is we measure our worth according to how well we fit that image that we've elevated in our mind. And any shortcoming that leaves us doubting our worth and feeling guilty, but the resurrection, it frees us from living under a burden of condemnation. It frees us from the guilt and the doubt that we're not good enough because it shows us the image that we are guaranteed to become. 1 Corinthians 15, 49, Paul writes, Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. We will become like Jesus. He is the image that we are to pursue. So we can stop trying so hard to rise to that image that we've elevated because Christ has been risen for us. Our clear purpose is to know him and to make him known. That is the purpose that the resurrection gives us, to know him and to make him known. So as believers, the resurrection, it makes our faith sure and it makes our future secure and it gives us a clear purpose. And what I want to do in the few minutes I have remaining is I want to apply this to two groups of people that I believe are in this room. And I'm not saying that everybody belongs to one of these groups, but I'm saying they're representatives of each of these groups here. The first group that I want to apply this to are those of you who are desperate for change. Right now, I don't know what it is, but there's something in your life that has got you to the conclusion that something's got to change. The good news of the resurrection is that it promises new life. Now, the temptation for you, though, is to think that what needs to change is what's around you. It's your spouse that needs to change. It's your job that needs to change. It's the system that needs to change. So here's my question for you. Are you willing to be changed? You see, to experience the power of the resurrection, you first have to die to yourself. You have to let go. You have to surrender and give it over to Jesus. 
being raised with Christ means you are the one that has changed. You are the one that experiences a death to self so that you can then be made new and alive to God. This past May, I had the opportunity to go with one of our teams from Mercy Hill down to Peru. We've been going there for four years in a row now, working with the same people group, and I had been invited to speak uh, with a group of pastors that were down there. And so this was the last day of our trip, and uh, we go to that meeting with pastors, and um, there were some other believers who would come because they wanted to meet us and hear from us, and we were super humbled by that. And there was one lady in particular, she was in her mid-20s, she had her two small children with her. And when I got there, the missionary informed me that she wanted to be baptized, and she wanted me to do it. I thought, okay, this is going to be interesting. Um, and so the missionary continued by telling me kind of a little bit about her life and saying that her husband had been continuously unfaithful, and there's just a lot of pain, a lot of hardship. And so I, I admit that I assumed, okay, perhaps she wants to get baptized thinking that it'll somehow change her circumstances, right? Perhaps she thinks that God is mad at her right now, and if she does some religious activity, then it will appease uh, his wrath and that um, it'll, she'll cha- he'll change her circumstances. So I go with a missionary, and we step to the side with this lady. Her name was Eva. And I asked her, just like I would ask any of you that were coming to be baptized here at Mercy Hill, I said, Eva, tell me why you want to get baptized. She didn't tell me that she hoped baptism would change her circumstances. Rather, she told me that Jesus was changing her in the midst of her hardships. She told me that as she thinks about what Jesus had done for her on the cross and in the resurrection, that it it gave her these new responses and she couldn't explain why she was responding so differently to her husband. The the, the bitter anger that she once felt for him was was gone and there was forgiveness in its place. And Eva knew what her husband would likely do when she got baptized, what he would do to her when she got baptized. But she said, I want to follow Jesus anyway. I want to give my life to him. And so we marched down to the river and Eva was baptized. It was her declaration that she was sure of her faith. It was her public declaration that Jesus had died for her sins and risen for her salvation. And through baptism, she embraced her life's new purpose of obeying Christ and making him known. Now, in just a few weeks, we are going to be baptizing here at Mercy Hill. And for those of you that are desperate for change and God's spirit is just doing a work in your life to where you are now saying, yes, this is true. I believe and I am willing to be changed. Baptism is your next step and you can simply fill out that baptism card. It's in the seat back in that pocket in front of you. Fill it out, drop in the offering bucket at the end of our service and we'll follow up with you. That's your next step to declare to others that you are sure of your faith and to begin going and telling But the second group that I want to address are those who are here today and you might be afraid of change. Don't you find it interesting that Mark ends his account of these women running in terror? They're afraid. You know, for some of us, it's been a long time since we've allowed the resurrection to stir our hearts and affections. It's not that you don't believe it. It just doesn't move you like perhaps it once did or it doesn't move you like you know that it should. I found myself here and I've questioned, how could this happen? How could such revolutionary truth like the resurrection not move me more than it does? And I realize that I'm not moved by it because I don't want to be moved by it. Opening my heart to the truths my head knows, it might mean radical change for me, and that scares me. See, like the women in Mark 16, I'm actually terrified by the thought of what a living Jesus might do. So think about this. The women, these three women, they rise early one morning to go and open up a grave to anoint a decaying body, okay? Now, that unnerves me a little bit, right? Um, I mean, I get queasy just cleaning out the back of the refrigerator, Right? So, so this idea of opening up a grave, it's kind of spooky to me. Um, but they seem eager to do it. Right? It says they woke up early that morning, and they're already on their way before they realize, hey, you know what? We might need some help moving this stone. They're eager to do this. They're not scared because this was all part of the routine of their faith. It was expected. I practice my faith in a way that becomes routine and expected. Church on Sunday, community group on Tuesday, a serve project here or there, and that routine becomes comfortable. It becomes familiar. 
But then the women realize that Jesus is alive. And he's got an assignment for them. Go tell the others. Jesus is alive and he wants to see you. He wants to direct you. But if we're honest, a lot of us are more comfortable with a Jesus on the cross than a Jesus who is alive from the grave. See, the cross, it beckons our affection. The resurrection demands our allegiance. The resurrection demands response. You see, we aren't moved because we don't want to be moved. We keep our distance from Jesus because we're afraid he might ask us to let go of something that we'd rather hold on to, that he might ask us to go somewhere we don't want to go, to tell somebody that we'd rather not tell. We don't want to go through what might feel like a crucifixion in order that we would experience the power of his resurrection. And so if the reluctance to change resonates with you, my question is this. If because of the resurrection you can trust God with your eternity, can you not also trust him with your every day? Can you not see the power to raise Jesus from the dead is the same power that he has to give you to obey whatever he calls you to do? Can you trust God enough to sign your life over to him and say, use it however you desire. It is yours, Lord. Have your way. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your spirit would come and direct our hearts, would move us to see the implications of the resurrection. That the resurrection is not just a story to marvel at, but it, it changes everything. It changes what we live for. It changes who we are. It changes our future. It frees us from the burdens in this life. God, I, I pray that it would move us. And I pray, God, that you would give us the faith today to see that you are trustworthy, to see that we can count on you and that as scary as it might be for us to let go, as scary as it might be for us to, to enter into that change and to, to walk where you want us to walk, to go where you want us to go, God, I pray that we would have the faith in you to do that, that we would not leave this place continuing in our ignorance, continuing to just ignore the resurrection, but God, that we would submit to you. We would say, Lord, have your way. Have your way in me. In Christ's name I pray, amen.